I have so many questions. I mean, I did obviously do my job and do a little research on your career, <laughs> et cetera, and everything. But the juicy stuff happens live. So Yeah. We Hello, hope. everyone. Look at all my gorgeous faces, except half of you have blanked it out. But it's very close to Christmas, so I probably think. I like to picture you all sitting there drinking and eating way too much, not <laughs> having gotten out of your pajamas in like two weeks. We have Shannon Elizabeth Parks here with us today, and we are going to have a fabulous call. Please remember, guys, yes, 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 the treadmill. I'm not even going to get started on that. You'll, you won't, Shannon won't get any chance to talk. Yeah, so, <laughs> I saw that. I was coveting it. Yeah, biggest news on earth. So <laughs> what we're going to do is, as always, if you have a question, make sure you type in CAPS question. If you type the whole thing, I'll go ahead and ask it. If you just would like to talk yourself, have a moment on YouTube, then just type the word question and I'll, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, everything else, as fascinating as it is, I'm going to ignore it so I can pay attention to Shannon during the call. And with that said, let's start. So Shannon, I have a question. What is <laughs> well, Okay, the thing is, as you, and I think you, I don't think we need that much introduction because everyone knows Shannon. And she, you, and it's not a secret. Your pseudonym isn't a secret, is it? Because I see it's. No, no, it's just, you know, I've been recording for so long. Back, back in the good old days, most of us had pseudonyms and I just never switched mine. Yeah, do you narrate under both Shannon and your pseudonym or just. No. I've only ever narrated under uh, Marguerite Gavin and my super, super secret romance pseudo. Oh, okay. So you've got several pseudonyms. I've so got that's two. hardcore. Yes, <laughs> I've got two. So you but Marguerite, coach. Grab Marguerite Gavin is my grandmother's name. So there were certain things, racy things, that I couldn't record under her name. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. That would feel kind of tacky, wouldn't it? It would feel Grandma, weird. sorry. Yeah. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you, but you coach under Shannon, right? And yes. You, you narrate. And did you ever consider narrating under your name when you first started? I, I didn't. Um, and then by the time that I really considered um, switching to Shannon, you know, we never know how much of a fan base we have, but I think there was enough of a fan base that nobody would have known who Shannon Parks was particularly. Yeah. And the publishers that I was working with at that time um, really weren't interested. They sort of wanted Marguerite Gavin. They know what, they, they know what they're looking for because yeah. hopefully Marguerite Gavin is going to sell a, a few more thrillers than Shannon Parks is. It's so. a serious name, isn't it, Marguerite? I mean, it's yeah. a serious name. <laughs> <laughs> so so then you coach so how you've done so much I want to try to get a timeline so you're an you're an actress mm -hmm. you're a director how, what was the timeline like from working full-time as that and then jumping into narration and and what was the thinking how did that all happen I know you said Grover yeah that's the, the the story Grover's probably really uh, um tired of this story if he listens to these things <laughs> But I started it, and and can and I continue to be an actress. Um, I started as an actress in the theater, and then I um, over time started also directing. Um, Grover was a director in a show. He was directing me in a show. Uh, I had a little kid at the time. I had gone through graduate school with my son on my hip. I started when he was nine months old. I was still nursing. <laughs> it was a mess. Um, so, you know, Grover had been recording for a while and a lot of the, I was in DC at the time and a lot of narrators were, the, the sort of the start of narration was through Books for the Blind. So he really encouraged me and I thought, oh, this is not a good fit. I'm a people person. And, you know, so I just, I, I was actually pretty resistant to the, the whole idea. But um, at that time I needed a way to support my theater habit because it's, <laughs> difficult to raise a family in the theater um it is it's not like just a habit, financially isn't it? yeah it's an yeah. expensive habit it truly yeah. is and even in the best houses you know it's just 
not really enough money to, uh, if I was single and, you know, living on my own with no kiddos or pets even, you know, it would be different. <laughs> so I started, um, that's how I got my start. And Grover was really, really instrumental in that. He really encouraged me. Um, and then just for a long time, kind of kept it as a day job. In, in many ways. I, I mean, uh, I have to admit that it was sort of a day job. Um, and then I got so bored with it that I really thought, you know, you absolutely have to bring your acting game into this. Your how whole long, acting game. How long would you say before the boredom hit you? Oh, about five years. About five years. And I just started to, you know, and of course we all get bored. We get titles that are tough and you know you're eating the elephant one bite at a time um but it was about five years in and as soon as i started to really treat it as an acting job um and in some ways a directing job the work became more interesting and then just about a couple of years ago um i started coaching which is such a nice fit because i love to teach and I love to direct, and I've been teaching and directing the whole way through. I just never turned, I didn't have time to turn my attention to working with narrators. Um, but that's been, I've been doing that and splitting that time. So about half, narr half coaching, half narration. And um, it's just been a spectacular experience for me to, to have the opportunity to work with people. So, so when you coach, and I've got an advantage here, I mean, it might seem like a disadvantage, but I actually have an advantage that I haven't coached with you, and I'm not familiar with your, if you have a curriculum, and you know how everyone has their, their thing, their mm -hmm. selling point, like Paul Rubin is the take it down, do less, do less, which I like love, because I need to yeah, be honest that. Out. How would you describe, like, what are you honing in on when you're meeting someone, and um, what is the, the, which way do you approach the coaching? Uh, well, I, I consider myself a performance coach for narration. I think there are so many other people out there that are better at doing the other things mm -hmm. um, or better at doing a hybrid of many things. You know, I think there are just so many fantastic coaches out there and teachers. Um, so what I focus on is what I'm best at, which is being an acting teacher. So I'm getting narrators that have never acted at all. And then I'm getting narrators that have a long, long experience of acting. And, but both require, um, a f a, you know, a, a figuring out of, of, of this particular craft, you know, yeah. because it's, it's many faceted. Um, so I spend quite a lot of time working with people on, um, developing a process for discovering character in fiction. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, we're also working technically. So we're trying to improve vocal range and find different, um, different places in voice, in your, in, in your voice, if we were working together, uh, that you might not be using. And so sort of developing um, greater access to your own instrument. So do you, that's do, you do directed reads as well? Do you do yeah, I do demos. So I, I do have, I, I think a curriculum, at least um, in the work that I do, is useful. I'm, I'm super, super flexible with that curriculum. Because people come in and they say, you know, I've got an audition, or I've got this, or I can't get this character. And if I'm yeah. like rigid in what we're doing, then I'm not serving that person. And that's my job, is to facilitate their success. So um but the, the, I have two curriculum that I work from. One is, is, is a really a big, kind of a basic acting class. Okay. And almost everybody starts there and most everybody transitions to a more sophisticated curriculum, which we look at genre. And while we're looking at genres, we're also working on demos. So, you know, people are finding material and then we're doing a directed demo, which, um, I think can be really useful. Uh, it, it's quite different from the experience of actual narration because we don't get very much creative direction except from ourselves as narrators. I would, wouldn't you kill for that? Wouldn't you just love to have a director all the time? Like, can I just hire, like, you know how some people want to get rich, they can have a personal chef. I want a personal director. It's just to like stand by him. Right. You yeah, know what I mean? Thing, 
I do, I do. And actually, um, a, a narrator, Tim Pabon, who's a wonderful bilingual uh, narrator, Spanish, uh, his parents are, Span are from Spain. And uh, he and I were feeling very restless with no theater to do um, when COVID hit. And we started working on, um, we were just looking around for a book with our director mentor, who's our, both of our mentor. And he was going to direct us and we were going to take a year to just work through this book and or whatever book we found. And I just thought it was going to be the most luxurious experience. Yeah. But of course, life took over and we just didn't have time to organize it. But I think that we will. Um, I just think that the idea to me of being really luxurious yeah. and taking your time with the book, getting feedback, what, what, a, what, a, what the director is hearing you know, I just, I agree with you. But more than a director, I would love to have a stage manager in my life. If I could pay for anything, it would be someone to stage manage my life, to take care of all the little pieces, to sort of tell me where I need to be, when I need to be there. They can give me a half hour call, 15, five, then you're uh, on. See, I, I like that stuff. I'm, I'm, so type A that I love that stuff. I wouldn't let, but I would like a stylist and a director. <laughs> and see, I'm the opposite. I am not type A at all. So I have to be careful and structured and, you know, um, I, have to I got that by your Facebook like profile or one of your profiles where you said something about like being a beach girl. And I, and I've got to say, I thought, okay, she's one of those gorgeous California beach girls. That's like kind of like laid back and still ends up being super successful. And I have to be honest, I don't, I've never had a laid back moment in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, can... I don't think anybody that describes me would describe me as laid back. Um, I think probably not. I think I'm a little uh, more emotionally intense than that. But I will say that moving to the ocean um, <clears throat> kind of changed everything for me in yeah. terms of just settling down, calm down a little bit, be outside, be in nature. All summer long, I'm just in the ocean like a dolphin, even if I can only go down there for 20 minutes, you know, even if I can only get a little bit of a run on the beach, I just, it's never lost its um, spark for me. And I've been here almost seven years. So you, you go know, every day. I try. Yeah, wow. I try. Even if it's just for just to go gaze at the ocean and then leave, I find it to be a really good reset. Um, and um and it does keep me, it get, just gives me enough perspective that it keeps me calm. Reminds me that I'm not the center of the universe. <laughs> you know? but, but what, well, you know what you said, and that fascinates me. Two things you said. Oh my God, I've got so many things I want to ask. Okay, two things you said that fascinate, fascinate me. First, when you were talking about your, your colleague and you wanting to do a book with your mentor and how luxurious it would be. And that feeling, and it made me think that because I've done books, I like, to, let me preface this because it's going to be on YouTube and also I might cut it out, that <laughs> I bring my full 100% A game to every book I do for the record, but I'm really, really, and I'm at the five-year mark, coincidentally, mm -hmm. trying yeah. to manage who I bring into the booth. I want to feel that luxury because we've all had, you book the book of a lifetime, but that book is always from a publisher with a very short deadline. Mm -hmm. But you want to do every sentence with lyrical depth and yeah. meaning. And really in your head, you're going, oh crap, oh crap. I've got to be, I've got to be great for this one. What am I going to do? <laughs> so, right. The pressure of the, of the material. But how do you bring that in the booth? How do you manage your emotions when you go into the booth to attain some of that luxury yourself? Well, I am, um, this is something that has developed probably over the last 10 years, um, maybe even a little bit longer. Let's say 12 years, does matter. Um, I was going through a, a, a really difficult time in my life. My kid was having a lot of problems and it was a long period of time. And um, I, I just kept going into my studio and dragging all of it with me, 
like Santa Claus with the bag, just all of, and I couldn't concentrate my work. There's a little period of time where the work is crap. I know that it is because I couldn't concentrate. And um, so what I started to do, and people laugh at me about this, but it's the truth. I started to treat my studio as sacred. That going inside that studio, I was not going to bring all of those stickers of anxiety, literally like wiping them off, getting them off of me, um, so that I could go in and be inside that booth and only be doing that the job that was in front of me, just as I would um, only be, you know, the three hours of a play every evening. That's all I would be doing. I'm not also thinking about my grocery list or my son who's in trouble or whatever it is How so part of it, it is it? How did, um, you, did you have rituals or i needed the quiet i needed i needed the calm and that headspace so in yeah. some ways it was an escape and when i started to think about the studio as something that was healing that i could escape to then the work oh. then then i was enthusiastic about the work um, and didn't feel like, oh God, I've got to go on record and I've got all this stuff in my life. It was sort of like, oh, okay, let me just take a breath and be in here. The other thing that I did was I used to have pictures of my kids and all this inspirational stuff and all this extra stuff in my studio. The, where I work has literally nothing in it except what is absolutely required to do the work. Wow. So those distractions being taken, I don't even take my phone into the booth. That computer doesn't have, I don't have any icons for social media, nothing. Yeah, we're so, opposites. Yeah, so <laughs> here we might be. We probably I've make awesome Corsets friends, right? and faux print le leopard fur and pictures. <laughs> yeah, and see, that is how I used to do it. But I just found that, that it was, I, I'd look up and there would be my little child and I'd start thinking about what was going on with mm -hmm. them or whatever it was. So um, uh, I think, I'd, yeah, some rituals around just creating space for that, what I call relaxed readiness. You know, that, that you're, so, so going in there, and yeah, there, it, is, it is a little ritualized. You'll like this because you're type A, where it's sort of the mug. I need to have a particular mug, a particular bottle of water. They're <laughs> in a particular that. place on the desk. You know, I'm getting my, my studio, even where, the, um, where I work on a kneeling chair, it, everything is spiked, right? So spiked in the theater just means you lay down a little piece of tape yep. to say this yep. is where the piece of furniture Seri goes. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> I love I that. I do everything I can to make it completely easy for me to just hop into that book. Now, am I successful all the time? Not really, but I do need to have those... Um, those little rituals, those particular things, just to aid in concentration, because I can definitely see something shiny. You know, but even over. even the tweak, even the mental tweak of oh, I'm going to my my quiet place. Even the mental tweak of I'm going to my safe. I hate. We just said I hate that word now. We did, so right. But I'm going to a place I can feel comfortable and rig instead of. I'm not saying this ever runs through my mind, but I'm sure it does through the audiences. So on their behalf, instead of, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to finish three finished hours and it's got to get done. I've got to get in there. I've got to get in there right now. Yeah. I would never do that, obviously, but just in case. <laughs> I would. Yep. I would all the time. <laughs> yeah. I think that that just supports, for me, it just supports it a little bit that, you know, okay. And I talk about this with my students a lot. In some ways, it really is a safe space because there's some kind of rattling and big noises going on outside. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I talk about this with my students. First of all, if it really is safe space in that you can access all of that emotion that you were just talking about and you can be honest with it and you can expose, which I think is the job of an actor mm -hmm. and therefore a narrator. Um, and nobody's watching and the emotional commitment is only going to make your work better. So you don't have to worry about that little piece. 
and you know you can you can occupy this space without anybody judging you unless it's yourself and that inner critic is going on and on and beating <laughs> that up. you know it happens and it still happens for me but i think that you know sort of treating your space as a that you work in as a place that is that you can take risks in because it's quiet and it's private and it's just your little womb if you will right yeah <laughs> So, yeah, those things are helpful to me. To other people, um, absolutely not at all. Like, I have a lot of students that really need 85 Lucky Charms, you know, of stuffed animals and awards yeah. and stuff in their studio. I do, I do need bling, and but I yeah. do that at corporate offices. It's not very popular. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I love so, it. I've got another question for you. And this is not a popular question because every time I see it, I, I ask somebody this, I kind of see them look like a deer in the headlights. Oh, if you brought it up <laughs> and, and I'd be really interested in your take on it because I ask everyone. You mentioned, I'm fascinated with the difference in genres. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's something that I'm missing intellectually about it because and, and I've asked everyone, I've, you know, w booked a class on it, I've done the whole thing. But because I'm a thriller girl, I like the thrillers, the specific type of thrillers I like, but I like all dark fiction. Yeah. And I think that listeners are listening for something. And it's not enough just go on Audible and listen, because I've listened to dark fiction every yeah. night of my life for like 20 years. I, mm -hmm. I, I know a good story. I know a good narrator, but I can't put my finger on what I think people hear different things. And I don't think it's necessarily just the voice, but you mentioned that you talked about genres to your students. What mm -hmm. is it that you talk about? How do you approach? Do you think there's a specific sound for specific types and not just voice age, because I'm an actress and it pisses me off when people say yeah, voice I age. Because I yeah. do a great eight-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> right. None of us, I, well, I, all of us want to think we can do everything. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so the way that I work with genre is really as a vehicle for... Um, so for instance, in thriller, we are looking at urgency, driving a story, creating suspense. In romance, we're looking at relationship and getting deeper inside of a relationship, you know, its functionality, its dysfunctionality, whatever's, you know, what's, what's deeply going on and using our imaginations to fill in the blank because a lot of times we get a book and it's just thinly written in terms of character, and that's when we really get to play and be inventive. Um, in sci-fi fantasy, we're really looking at using the whole voice, um, and because you oh. can take from bigger risks there. You know, you've got aliens oh. and werewolves and witches, and so hopefully we do sci-fi fantasy generally last, and in doing that, hopefully by that period of time, the narrator has gotten to know their voice a little bit more and, and is willing to take bigger risks. Oh, so now this um, is exciting. This is the stuff that I've wanted to delve into when it comes to genre, because I know there's something. I know yeah. there's something they hear with their favorite thriller narrators. I mean, I do quite a lot of thriller, but yeah. I want to be the thriller girl. <laughs> Right. So I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to pretend right. I'm all. No, humble. and you should and be, be bold. You know, and there are a lot of Americans on this call. I mean, who are we kidding? We're a country <laughs> of ambitious people. You yeah. know. Yeah. Exactly. And I love there's it. There's a secret, and this I'd never heard that about the sci-fi either. So well, how I mean, I think that I don't know that I know that things are di divided loosely into genre, and I and mm -hmm. I feel like it's more important to discover the author's tone and intent than to sort of play to genre. Okay. So really what I'm doing is, um, is through genre and through the exploration of, you know, different pieces and, and talking through, to, I, to, uh, to work on specific acting tasks. I'm not certain about the, I know for instance, there's a big difference in what I'm bringing to the table 
on a cozy mystery, which God knows why, but I get a lot of them. I've got like six cozy series. <laughs> it's, it's baffling to so me. It's laid back. <laughs> it's baffling to me. But um, so I know that what I'm going to bring to a cozy is different than what I'm going to bring to a thriller, even though they're both, you know, mysteries, right? Right. Right. Um, and that's going and to the really, acting. That's the core. Yeah. You're playing the character in the moment. And so trying you to you think really that's all there the is? Audience. I don't think that's all there is, but I'm like you. I, I'm not certain it can be nailed down. I, I know that I bring sort of a different, not a different Shannon, but just a different energy to various genres. But you know, that can shift. You know what I mean? You can be in the middle of a book and go, oh my gosh, there's a car chase in here. Or, oh my gosh, the serial killer just showed up. And now it's no longer, you know, it doesn't feel like a cozy anymore, or it doesn't feel like. So I think that there's a good deal of fluidity there. And I really, I don't know that I have the answer to that I know I don't have the answer to that question. Yeah. Well, I and I know. wonder if there is an answer to it. I yeah. mean, it's a weird, because I don't really know the, I know there's a male narrator, I don't know if you've ever heard him, called Jeff Harding. And mm -hmm. he does, he does a lot of thrillers. But um, he's an American and he lives in the UK. But the thing about Jeff, and I'm a big fan, big, big fan. But the thing is, is his voice. And it's not just his voice. It's something about the way he reads. Like, like when Johnny Heller reads, it's very distinctive. And you, you kind of know what kind of book you're... He, and he can be versatile. And every book is different. Uh -huh. But there's some... And so when I hear Jeff Harding's voice, it immediately, I know I'm going to... And it's not just going to be a thriller. It's going to be a good thriller. Yeah. And I want to nail that. I want... Do you know, I think, aren't we all searching for that? That mm -hmm. people hear our voice and immediately connect it with whatever type of book we want them to connect it to. Mm -hmm. But figuring yeah, it out. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I've always been pretty hesitant to pigeonhole myself as a narrator because yeah. I do believe that the reason that I've worked consistently is range. And I know that on the, on the, I was a coach on Johnny Heller's retreat call and it was so great to get to listen and talk with the, in the producer circle that they had at the end. That was fantastic information. Yeah. Yeah. I know that the producers are saying, tell me how to cast you. And we don't believe that everybody can do everything, which is true. There's always a, a narrator that is going to be better for whatever thing yeah. it is. Um, but for me, range has been important in terms of the, you know, I've got, I'm working on a, a, a classic right now. The next one is a thriller. The next one is sci-fi. Then I've got this very dry um, academic book. So there's a big range there. And I've always been kind of afraid to completely go, yeah, I'm the fantasy person or I'm the thriller person because I, yeah. I, I, I still needed all of those other all of those other books. Maybe now that I'm coaching, it can be a little bit more selective. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I love that. It's a that's a hard one, isn't it? Because I've because I might have pigeonholed myself pigeonholed myself because my entire website looks like a thriller cover. But isn't that what those producers were saying? Tell us how to cast you. Yeah. Yeah, I but then on the other hand, I do romances, and are they ever going to... Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's Sean said something on the last call. He said, they're going to pigeonhole you anyway, and they hear my voice, and I am i don't sound like... you know. But I've done a lot of romances. But well, I think it's great. This is something that... I'm sorry I interrupted you. It's a no, no, help. no. I'm fascinated by this. Everything you're saying is um, like a light bulb. Well, so, so here's the thing. I, um, I think that an, an authentic, that, you know, the essence of your personality, the essence of your voice and being specific with that is, I think, very, very important. As you were saying, we all know it's a Johnny Heller book. And yeah. part of that is because Johnny's voice and his energy are so specific. There are a good right. number of narrators out there like that. You know exactly what you're going to get from them. So we don't want that to become, or I don't want that to become, 
limiting, but I do want them to know when they hear something, oh, that's Marguerite Gavin. Right, right. You know, right out of the gate, that's what I yeah. want because I, I want to be identifiable, which is sort of a different thing than how they're going to cast us or whether you get pigeonholed or not. I actually think that the authenticity of your sound is kind of a magical thing. I don't think we should try to be sounding like each other. I think that the essence of, uh, if we can bring the essence of our humanity and what's authentic and unusual about us right. and the hot mess, the hot messes that we are, if we can bring all of that, then it's just, um, I just feel like we're, 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 we're bringing more of our game. Right. So I wouldn't apologize in any way or be or or feel that that was um, something that you needed to resist. Your voice is your voice is your voice. And it's a fantastic voice. And it's yours and it's only yours. Same thing with your personality. I, I used to, you know, be very competitive with other actresses and just not mean ever but just like oh well holly twyford got it therefore her success is my failure let's say yeah. Holly twyford's a yeah. fantastic dc actress um so her success is my failure and i used to sort of wrap myself up in that and then uh, you know <clears throat> after i um got some maturity and some age i started to think well every room that i walk into to audition there are 10, 12 other women kind of just like me that have my resume, that have my training, that have anything that I can bring to the table. So well, what do I have to offer? Well, the, the, the thing that I have to offer is my essence, is me. Because those 12 other women can't be me and I can't be them. So there's something kind of liberating in that. And, you know, if I don't get a book, if I've auditioned for a book, well, I know that it's not about me. It's simply that somebody else's essence was a better fit, according to the author or the casting director or whomever. That kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off and, and the self-consciousness. And it, it brings you closer to the Johnny Heller authentic. That's what burlesque taught me. That's what burlesque is. There's enough gorgeous to go around. And it comes exactly. in all different packages. And I every single that. one, that's what yeah. drag queens are. Every yeah. single one of them is gorgeous because they own that. Yeah, and I, I, that, I, I love that. I totally agree with you about drag queens. Um, it's, it, my, my daughter is, uh, she just turned 20. And um, it, this is Sean's daughter as well. Yeah. And she is almost six feet. And I've watched her, because Sean's 6'4", and I'm 5'9", so she, she comes from big old people, hardy stock, I guess. But she's almost six feet, and for the longest time, she did this. And then I just kept watching her. I mean, it was so interesting. It was just this, like, blossoming into her height and into her power in the world as a, as a, as a big, tall woman. And you know? the room. And, and just, yeah, she slays. She absolutely slays. And, but I watched her sort of start here, you know, hiding her height until she occupied it. And they, and, and that's one of the things that excites me about, about coaching is to, to sort of watch people do that and come into themselves and own their own power. I'm fascinated with that. I really am. So what quests, so what do you wish, because we don't hear, I believe that we don't learn lessons just when somebody teaches them to us. Like sometimes we learn them no. five years later and go, oh, wow, that's. So what do you try to tell your students most often that you find they're in the most need of learning that you wish you could just like plant in their brain, but you know that they're going to have to go through it themselves? What like do you wish you um, could get across to them? Yeah, the, the answer is super easy because it's it's the same for everybody, no matter their level of experience. And, and I experience it all the time. And that is that that inner critic 
that is constantly berating you or questioning your work or questioning your ability or making you feel as if you somebody let you slip in the back door and you don't really belong there and you're an yeah. imposter. My name All is of my... named Trevor. <laughs> right. Trevor. <laughs> Uh, if I spoke to, I would never speak to another, well, there's one human that I would speak to this way, but otherwise there's nobody in the world that I would speak to in the way that I find myself speaking to myself. So not all the time, but sometimes, and you're not even really aware of it. It's just this tape that's playing that is telling you how terrible you are. Yeah. Um, so I, that's the, that I wish that I had learned how to quiet that early on and what I have discovered and yet that particular one I still struggle with it in this 20 plus years as a narrator and 30 years as an actress I still struggle with quieting it but now I have some techniques to get it quieted down and the techniques have to do with actually investing in the work there isn't a whole lot of room for if you're really in a book <laughs> There isn't a whole lot of room for that noise that's just, you know, questioning everything that you do and that cycle. Yeah, because you're not and, there, are you? You're the mm -hmm. character. The yeah, narrator shouldn't not, even be in the room. The narrator should have left the room. Yep, exactly. And it's difficult with narration, I think, because we do have so many other jobs. You know, we have other tasks and we do need that the kind of, I, I try to think of that inner critic as a monitor. And that the, the, instead of a critic, it's a monitor to catch things. So there's a great big noise outside. I'm going to stop and just wait for the noise to go away and go, the monitor caught that. I was busy being in the book, right? I was busy playing my characters. I like that. Yeah. I mean, and, so, and sometimes it just, there are just days that that doesn't work. Um, but deepening your commitment to your acting job and really being specific in your choices and really being deeply invested in the story that you're telling, they're just, that quiets things down. And I wish that I had learned that earlier on in just in my whole career as an actor, um, that that level of self-consciousness is paralyzing. Yeah. We just don't make the best creative choices when we're constantly um, second guessing ourselves, I guess. I had that on stage, depending on how much I weighed. Oh, Ridiculous. yeah. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yep, I hear that. I hear I, that. I, I, like, live in fear, and that takes you right out of, oh, you know. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course, you have too many other things to do. You, you're in character. You're trying not to fall down the stairs in four-inch heels, dancing backwards, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> Smoking you know. a six-pack of cigarettes on stage and you've never smoked in your life. <laughs> exactly. You're trying to make those fake stage cigarettes work and be credible. <laughs> I mean, it, so there are too many other things to be thinking of to also have the noise of, of that critic. And, and I think, you know, we slide in and out of it. We feel good about our work. I mean... I'm working on a really, really tough book right now. And I'm thinking, you know, you're, this is, you're, you're out of your range. You're not ever going to be able to do this. And the truth is, of course I can do it. I've got 600 books under my belt, but wow. I'm just having trouble accessing this particular book. It just needs more prep. It just needs a deeper investment is really what's going on. But what is happening when I started recording it, I was like, just in my head, oh, this is awful, you've got to stop work, you know? <laughs> so I did, I stopped and I went out and worked on the book a little bit more instead of just getting in there and, and doing a mediocre narration of it. Um, so, you know. Well, let me ask you, we've covered the, the parts because everyone has the same struggles and everything. And can you search back in your mind for the first time as a narrator that you were just like, had a, like that, because I don't think we stop and notice these times that you had that kind of flush of like pride that something yes. was like, you done something really well or exciting or something great happened. Do you remember the first time that happened, how it felt? Yeah, I do. It happened on my first book. Wow. Which is, I can't even believe it. Um, I, I got, um, I think it was, I think it was Blackstone. 
black i think it was i can't remember right now which your client first was book first client isn't that <laughs> awful i know we, i know my first book and it was this so it wasn't a 30 minute book on keto from acx then. <laughs> no then we didn't have acx back in the day um this was it might have been for books on tape anyway regardless it was called the garden party by Catherine mansfield and um i really didn't know what i was doing but in that book, it's a series of short stories. And in that book, there's just this beautiful, beautiful section where a character sings a, a couple of songs, I think. And that I had access to. I, you know, like I really didn't know what the hell I was doing with the book at all. I was trying, you know, being an actor, but it was my first audio book. Yeah. Um, but then I got, I sang it, this lullaby and a couple of other things. And it got a really nice review, uh -huh. it, uh, you know, but based on the singing, I'm sure, not on the narration. But I just remember kind of going, oh, my skill set and my life set, because I'd been singing since I was a real little girl and knew a lot about folk music and stuff. And so I, I just thought, oh, this is something I can bring myself to this. I can bring my energy and my talent and the things that I already know. And then I've got these other things to work on, you know? So it was, it was, it was that, I think it was the garden party and those. I those love that. Songs. I love, you know what? That's a really good point. And you made me remember something. The first book I did, I lie. I didn't lie. I didn't lie, but I might've just like let them keep thinking that I was really uber experienced. But <laughs> so I rocked up at a studio to do a nine hour book in like three days or two days. The, it was um, Anna Madrigal. It was an amazing book. I wish I could do it again now that I know what I'm doing. And yeah. I showed up, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. I didn't even know, I have an actress. I didn't even know how to use a microphone, didn't have a clue. And I remember I walked out that first day with like no voice and called someone from like my phone in the middle of Soho. And I screamed, I'm gonna do this, I can do this. And you know what? Until you just said that, I had completely forgotten that moment. And you know what's funny? Think about it. I think it's probably when we first start that we allow ourselves to experience that delight. The joy of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, every once in a while, um, I'll, I'll have a book that is that synchronizes for whatever reason. You know, yeah. that it just feels... And I do let myself celebrate those. Yeah. And it really does not matter how it's received. Well, first of all, I don't read reviews. I had yeah, I to read either. reviews to, to put together a new website recently, a couple of years ago. But I hadn't read a review in 15 years before that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I don't have this external sort of flow of, Oh, this award. I mean, I didn't, I was nominated for an audience, didn't even know it one year. Didn't know it. Congratulations, they, I don't know they by the way. To send the thing. <laughs> well, but I mean, I didn't know it. My friend Jennifer Mendenhall was there and she took a picture of my picture on the wall and she's like, where are you? And I, it was, I don't know, 10 o'clock on the night of the audience, no idea. So I don't have a connection to an external validation other than that the work keeps coming in because, because you said didn't you just like casually drop oh yeah because i've done like 600 books and, and, and uh, like that. but it's and been I 23 people, years sweetie i mean it's been a long time but it's do you not, not miss like, celebrating because i know someone that said oh i, I see people celebrating oh, i've done 100 books i've done and i'm not good at celebrating yeah. but don't <clears> you think <throat> i mean 600 books like maybe pop some champagne the but beach. you know what? It was so funny because I, yeah, that face champagne on the, they'd be a little chilly right now, but sounds good. I'm going to take your advice. Right. Um, uh, I think it was Jennifer Mendenhall and Mike Kramer were interviewed. Um, and she reads as Kate Redding and Mike Kramer reads as Mike Kramer. And they're both just fantastic narrators. They've been doing this forever, a lot longer than me. And uh, they were asked how many books, did they know how many books? And they really didn't know. And I really don't know how many books are out there. They're not on all on Audible. So right. early on, a lot of the books I was doing for books on tape or, you know, Redwood, they're just not on Audible. Yeah, so I don't actually have a, 
a real number. I, I know how many books I've done in the last three years or so, but before that, it's just a, a, a blur. I really don't know, you know, what the number is. But just adding the years and then the money, basically, is where I get that <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> I don't have a list of the books anywhere. I mean, it's really, it's kind it's, of but it terrible. Is good. I think I, th I understand because I think I am like that. I am more like you. I kind of wish I was like those people because I kind of wish I got oh, more yeah. excited, but I'm always just thinking about like the next job and also doing things that are really juicy that you really want to do like books that you can't wait to do that. You're really, I don't even care if anyone listens to it. For the yeah. writers, obviously, you know, you care, but just to do the book. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. I agree with you. I agree. And I think that you're absolutely right that it, because it's such a solitary, isolated profession and nobody else is going to go buy a grocery store cake and, and yeah. balloons, that it's probably, you're right, a good idea for us to celebrate, uh, to mark our successes um, yeah. it's, it's not something that I do it, but, but I think it's, I think it's probably a, a necessary thing that's missing for me. I might do uh, it someday when I have time. Yeah. So you should <laughs> Next just, year. We'll, we'll just, we'll just hit a, let's say, you know, you hit a particular number of books, call me and we'll zoom. Hopefully we won't be zooming then, but we'll have our champagne together and I'll pretend that I just hit 600. How's that sound? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just hit 700. No idea now, how many books are out there. As with all the best guests, I keep forgetting to let other people actually ask questions as well. I have <laughs> um, the first person that's typed the big question in. They've all had lively conversations um, buzzing away. But Harry would like to, you notice I've kept it at Harry. We're on a first name basis this time, Harry, uh -huh. because I, his name's so long I keep slaughtering it. Um, he says, Shannon, did you find it a challenge to bring the scope of your acting from the space of the stage to the sanctuary of the booth? That's so beautifully worded. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. And I continue to, to struggle with that um, and work with people all the time um, uh, in, about being intimate, conversational, real. Um, I think that I didn't really have a piece of it. It just was never something that we really talked about. And I'm not saying that my work was like, oh, for a muse of fire, you know, it wasn't like huge, but it was past, I think about it as going past the microphone and not just talking to one person. Not so, intimate. Not intimate, just mm -hmm. sort of like talking to the masses. Um, and I think that if you think about it as a film close-up, so it's you're not in a room with 300 people. It's, it, it's the difference between being in a room with 300 or 20 or 500 people or a film close-up. And in a film close-up with the good actors, all they have to do is feel something or think something and we can see it. And I do believe that the same is true if we really are actually feeling something, not manufacturing it actually thinking something. I think it comes through in the performance and we don't have to work a whole lot harder than that. So if you think about it not being something that is um, projected out or pushed, but inside, internal, um, that's, that's been my path to becoming more intimate, which was a necessary one. And a lot of times I'll be doing a play and also recording. And so that's, that's when I have to really shift and dial it back. Oh, yeah. You know, cause, yeah. <laughs> so how do you feel, Shannon, about accents? And if you find that you have to work on the technical side of it, how do you maintain being in the moment while achieving a, an accent? It's a really good question. Um, the only way, to be perfectly honest, the only way that I stay in the moment when I have an accented character is that I'm really good at the accent. I often find myself just acting an accent because it's not something that I feel proficient at, but I've still got a guy that's Slovenian. And you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So his, 
his dialogue I'm, I'm, I'm having to be very careful with and I'm thinking about it. Um, so the goal for me, one of my goals personally, is to get proficient every year at a few more accents. So I don't have to think about it so much. It's very, very easy to act an accent, to sort of just let that be your character, the Russian guy, right? You know, um, and so it, it's, it's challenging. And I think that sustaining it and staying concentrated has to do with being pretty deeply familiar with that accent and being able mm -hmm. to forget that you're doing it, right? Um, I imagine there are some accent coaches out there that would disagree with me or that would have a, a better answer for that. Accents is probably my biggest challenge, I would say. And, and part of the reason it's a challenge is that I'm used to working in the theater where you've got a vocal coach and somebody coming in and teaching it to you with IPA and then it's easy, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, yeah, I get a little wiggy when I've got a bazillion accents in a book. It's, it's, it's a challenge. So I think it's a challenge for all of us. Um, and to me, it's just about in the accents that I have internalized that I know well, then I can act and I can be in character and I can play there. But, you know, if it's a if it's obscure and I haven't really really got the mastery of it, then um, yeah, I find I find myself just as you're saying acting. acting Some people dance. love it though. JS has a group and they they practice amongst each other, and they like obsessed like it like every inflection. I mean, they actually enjoy it. Me, they put up that chart of what's going on inside my body so I can like learn my. They lost me right there. Yeah, like. Yeah. I just don't. Um, okay, I'm getting off track again. I can't digress. I've got a question from Kat. Um, okay. I know I know you're very experienced in narrating, but I would like to know how you juggle all of the books that you mentioned you're working on now. Uh, how do I juggle them? How do you juggle? Because um, we're all kind of tired just hearing about it and thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm tired too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. So um, I think, you know, because we're so, the, everything, the quickest way to lose a job is to, a, a, a relationship with a publisher is to blow a deadline. So the deadlines um, become sacrosanct, of course, for me. And I try very hard um, because I have, a, you know, a chronic illness. I try very hard to give myself time on either side that gives me some flex time, just in case. Um, and the way that I schedule is, you know, just in how many, how many hours can I achieve this month? Sometimes it changes. So those books are spread out over the next, you know, I tend to do three or four books a month, depending on length. I mean, you know, yeah, it just depends. Um, and so I'm just careful scheduling those. Yes. So I don't want Knowing to end yourself. up in the studio having to do an eight hour session because I was sick on Tuesday and had to, you know, um, so scheduling becomes, I think, very, very important. Um, and then the, the discipline of what I have found, I'm not a particular, we were talking about this, you're type A and I, I'm really not. Yeah. Um, but I do have to have some established discipline of I'm going to get an hour and a half done five days a week or, you know, seven days a week, depending on what the project is. And, and the way that I have to do that is in a pretty disciplined way. I don't want to be doing that at three in the morning because what I if you're not well? I mean, I um, wasn't going to bring that up, but to, I'll be, I'll be really forthright. I had a brain tumor undiagnosed for like years and oh. I had headaches and I was like blind in the end. Oh and, my God. But the thing is, I kept doing as many people do when you don't feel you have a choice when you're chronically ill, you just yeah. keep going. And I can't imagine, because narrating is not easy on the body. It's a very, very strenuous mental, your brain takes yeah. up all your energy and, and narrating is using that at full capacity. Yeah, I so, agree. How do you manage? I mean, if you set yourself those, I have to finish such and such. Tell me if this is too personal, I can cut no, it out. No, it's okay. But if you set that up, but something happens and you're in pain, or I mean, is it like a constant battle to stay healthy enough 
to not get sick. And then what happens if you get sick and it messes up your deadline? Because our bodies don't always like stop being sick on time for yeah, us. To they finish. don't always cooperate. Yeah. Um, and that's the one thing about narration that I really don't like. You know, we could go to a regular job a little sick. But with narration, yeah. if you're a little sick, you can almost always hear it. Um, I guess I, not that I'm the, you know, pristine health queen or anything like that. <laughs> and, and it de definitely goes in waves. Um, but I do work hard to stay healthy. I work yeah. hard to have enough water and, and eat the right stuff and exercise. Um, and get outside is important for me. But I also think there has to be flexibility there. And so flexibility is, when you have an illness, you just learn that you have to be flexible and you have to be willing to adjust. So what's really, really important are, are those cushions. So if I do get sick, we're still going to be okay. And being disciplined while I am well. Um, I can count on, I have MS, so I know that there are going to be periods of time that I'm down and out. Um, but I'm just really careful with my schedule. And I am as careful uh, with my body as I can be. It's been a little easier during COVID because we're not playing as much. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, but, but you know what you, and, and I'm saying this from the heart, you, because in this job, there's a lot of pressure to, I never get sick. It's impossible. I'm not going to get sick. By the way, if there are any publishers listening, I will never get sick in my life. <laughs> there is a lot of pressure and you're an established narrator and we all have to watch our brand. And you're being candid about something that happens to every single one of us. It's natural. Your situation is different. You, you have to be more careful. You've, you know, and, but I can count, I've got, I can tell you at least eight people that are just members of Joe, some of them just starting out battling serious health issues or chronic health yeah. issues. And it's a scary thing. And I think somebody putting their hand, and that's why I tell people they get weird when you, when you say brain tumor, they start talking to you. Like they've taken yeah, they get scared. Out. Yeah. <laughs> but I know. It, to me, it's like, we're all going through things. And if I say it out loud, maybe somebody else that doesn't know what's wrong will be less scared and they'll feel like yeah. it's manageable. I can keep my career. What you've mm -hmm. just done by saying, look, you know, I look after my health. I have what you've just done can tangibly turn someone's life around. If they're desperate to be a narrator and they're, I know so many people, chronic pain, yeah. I'm, I'm never going to be able to do it. I'm not going to get through this. I'm not going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And you've yeah. just shown them a light. And you're a successful, shining example of what? A thousand audio books. <laughs> I mean, right. We don't know the number. So no, we'll it's not with a thousand. thousand. <laughs> well, I, I think that there, um, I used to try hard to hide my um, illness as an actor um, and as a director. And, but, illness and um, emotional, uh, mental health issues, life issues, they are nothing to be ashamed of. They are simply what happen to us as humans in our journey. And so, yeah, if I lose a job, if I lose a job with a publisher um, based on them, their idea that I'm weak because of my illness, well, tough luck. If it's not based on my work, then yeah, I kind of don't want to hear about it. And the fact um, that you've got so many audiobooks, obviously not turning out to be a problem. Well, so. it's not. It was a it was a tough year after my uh, brain surgery, which was about three years ago, March, because it really took me a year to sort of get my cognition fully back up to speed. I just felt like I couldn't remember anything, and so I had to get very disciplined. And what I would say to those folks that are out there, this is a good job if you have a chronic illness, yeah. right? You yeah. don't have to, if you wake up in the morning and you're blasted by whatever your symptoms are, you don't have to put on a suit and go to work. Yeah. So it's a good job if you have an illness. But what I would say to those people that are struggling 
is that allowing yourself, we have an idea, I think, in this culture, certainly, that in order to advance, we have to hustle. And we have to keep hustling. We have to hustle, hustle, hustle all the time. Well, I think that rest and recovery and reflection and restoration are more important than hustle, really. We have to hustle in order to be successful. But we also need to know when to stop and when to rest. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned since my brain surgery is there are periods of time where I have to rest. I could go in and work, but I'm going to end up redoing that work tomorrow. There's no question. Yeah, right? I went There's in. no question. I went in five days after my brain surgery. No. Mm -mm. And I went <laughs> in, I think, three weeks after. But it, the, it, it, I hear you on that. But there's no... It was mm -mm, stupid. There's... It was stupid. I was pointless. What, well, what am I even it, doing but, here? But you have to, I mean, for me, I had, to, I had to make a living. I had to start working because I had to make a living. And so I would say to the people that struggle with any health issues, which I certainly have, um, to remember that that your body is an instrument you, your body is your instrument yeah. it is the thing even though it's kind of feels like kind of head and shoulders we don't move our bodies no treat your body as your instrument really really take care of it and remember that rest is essential it's just essential don't cheat yourself of it and don't feel um don't i, I you know just it's a, it's, I guess in some ways I'm a little befuddled with words right now, but I think to risk sounding cliched, it's, it's kind of about forgiving yourself, that it's really all right, that you're sick, you didn't do anything to bring on this condition, and it's okay that this is the condition, and there are many, many hours in the day to get into the studio and work. Wow, the negative voice. Oh my God, I never really thought of that because my negative voice, Trevor, is like, you're sick again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and you're wow. getting energy from the humans around you. Yeah. It's like, you're sick again. Yeah. And you know that, um, if that's if that's what you're saying to yourself, and, and I get really mad at myself when I get wiped out with fatigue with MS, I get mad at myself. I want to push, you know, I want to push through that and I want to keep going with my life. Well, when I do that, I make myself sicker for one thing. And you wouldn't treat your child like that. Would you get oh mad at God, your child no. if they got sick? No, my <laughs> child requires 85 cups of tea if she's sick and she gets them. <laughs> it's true. She just needs tea if she's sick. Um, and my son's the same way. But yeah, I think that the, you, you got to create space for, if you are ill, you've got to create some space for the illness. And then when you're feeling well, be disciplined about how you work. That's what I have to do. That's the, <laughs> my sage advice. Oh, but I love I what know. a great takeaway. And bring a little luxury into the booth. I love your word, luxury. I've never thought yeah. about narrating being luxurious. Yeah, well, why shouldn't it be? I mean, it's a privilege to be able to do our work, you know? Yeah. Um, so might as well enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed the hell out of this interview. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Super fun. You're so good at interviewing. Oh, no, you, I told you it's because you're a good guest. The good guests are the best. And, and <laughs> I'll tell you guys, before Shannon came on, I'd never met Shannon before. And I didn't, you know, I, I'd not met her. And, but I kept having people sending me messages going, oh, my God, you're going to love Shannon. And it was her energy. And now oh. I get why everyone loves Shannon Elizabeth Parker. So <laughs> thank you so much. for Oh, I almost forgot. Please, can you say a word to our YouTube audience that will be watching Ad Infinitum? What shall I say? What would you like to leave them with final words of wisdom? Uh, just, um, just blessings and take care of yourselves and be kind to yourselves 
and be kind to everybody else and keep listening, keep listening, keep listening. <laughs> I love it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your time as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, sweetie. It was really a pleasure. And thanks everybody that was on the call. I wish I could see your faces. Thank you, guys. We love you all. Mwah, mwah. Take care and have a wonderful <laughs> holiday. Happy holidays. Sorry, everyone. You're our last call before the holiday. So oh, well, happy holidays. <laughs> Shannon was my gift for you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Take care. Bye, Shannon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.